So uh, as I said and mentioned in the introduction, uh, <clears throat> we want to uh, unpack the meaning of the attitude of faith. Uh, the emphasis of, of this lecture is not about what we ought to believe or what we can believe, but what it is to believe. Mazala amin. And this will be slightly uh, technical, philosophical, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be clear. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try, I'll try as much as I can, uh, because it's such a deep, subtle uh, issue. So let me start with uh, introducing a, an important distinction. And then we're going to go, uh, with the help of William James, to further inquiry into the attitude of Emuna. Intuitively, you say, well, we know what is Lamin. Lamin is a stance towards a proposition. For example, uh, there is a proposition, God exists. God uh, gave the Torah at Sinai. And you can take different stances towards this position. You can negate it, you can doubt it, you can know it, you can suppose it, uh, you can think it might be plausible, and you can believe it. And believe, belief is an, what uh, technically we would call it in philosophy, a propositional attitude. It's an attitude towards a proposition. A state, there is a statement about the world and you take an attitude towards the sense statement, and believing is one of these attitudes. And then if you want to know what is to believe, then you're going to ask yourself, among those attitudes, let's say, I doubt that God exists. Uh, I know that God exists. Uh, um, I think it's probable that God exists. So you'll to ask yourself, what marks belief as a particular attitude? For example, what will be the difference between believing and knowing? You would say one possible thought will be knowing is an outcome of a certain rational procedure. Believing is uh, uh, thinking that this proposition is true without the usual procedures of ascertaining a proposition, etc., etc. But one thing uh, uh, to start with. We say, OK, if you want to know what is belief, belief is an attitude among many attitudes we have towards a certain proposition. I will call that in my typology of belief. I said I have now three. I'm going to develop three typologies of believers or concepts of belief. Believing that. I believe that X. I believe that uh, Mashiach will come. I believe that X is the Mashiach, etc. But, and here comes a very interesting contribution of Buber to the concept of belief, saying that if we look carefully at the Hebrew uses, ancient Hebrew uses in the Mikra of belief, it's not believing that, it's believing in. Not la'amin she, ela la'amin be. Ve'amin ba'ashem va'yachshava lo la'tzedaka. Ve'yaminu ba'ashem uv'moshe avdo, etc. And you ask yourself, what's exactly the difference between la'amin she and la'amin be? Between believing that and believing in. And one way to say about that, well, believing in is not an attitude towards a proposition. It's an attitude towards a person, like love. It's to trust. You say, He trusted God. Well, Buber says something very interesting. He says that if we look at the and by the way, just to say something for the Lashon HaKodesh, after all, the Hebrew is remarkable, because when you look at the different ways in which the, the root of emunah is used, we have omenet. 
Why is omenet an omenet? Because what? You can trust her. A ta a take her. We have imun. What is imun? Practice. Practice makes someone trustworthy. Right? We have oman. Uman. Uman is someone who is a pro. We can trust him. This you cannot do with the English. But, but there is something very telling about the way in which the structure of emunah develops a whole field of, of semantic field where at the center of it is trust. I mean by Hashem. Now the argument is that trust, la min be, is irreducible to la min she. There is something more in a munah than just a certain attitude towards a proposition. Okay, so we start with a distinction, a very important. Now, now Buber would say in the history of Emunah there was a change, there was a dramatic transformation from believing in to believing that. For him, it's actually we lost something in in misunderstanding what is Emunah when we made that shift. Okay. So let's, let's keep in mind that distinction. Two modes of faith. La min she and la min be. The theologians are la min to believe that. They extrapolate from the system certain propositions. God exists, God is one, uh, God revealed itself in Sinai, etc. And they ask themselves, can we believe in that? Are they true? Are they false? Are they this? This whole project misunderstands the very nature of faith. Okay. Let's keep that in mind. We're going to go further to other distinctions, other, we're going to make some, I hope, some progress in the matter. But you see how that, that, that insight of Buber is so important. There is no, by the way, even in rabbinic literature, the, 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 uh, the juxtaposition of la min she doesn't exist. It's la min be. This is why you say, when you say someone who's no seven or ten be muna. Well, what do we mean, no seven or ten be muna? He's, he does it in, in a trustworthy fashion. Okay. Now, let's move further into, I think, a deeper distinction, a deeper understanding. I think, for me, is a central understanding in the, in the life of faith is a central moment, which I want to clarify through uh, the problem that you saw in William James about, can you will to believe? And I think it's a beautiful essay, a beautiful sermon, by the way, this is James says this is a philosophical sermon. There is such a genre. And uh, and we want to ask a different question. In the history of uh, Jewish thought and in the history of philosophy, there is an argument that you cannot decide to believe. Uh, you know, I and and the argument has two trends to it. One is it's kind of an empirical fact. Uh, I cannot decide to believe now that there are a thousand people in this room. I, I can decide to move my hand. I can decide to walk out of the room, but I cannot decide. To, uh, there is no way. It's not. A matter of decision, by the way, Ramba, uh, 
uh, critiques of the Rambam's idea that you can commend faith say it's not a matter of decision. You cannot commend it. It cannot be an act of will. I cannot look at this uh, shirt and say I now believe that it's yellow. I decide to believe that it's yellow. You might say from an evolutionary point of view, uh, it's a good thing that the, uh, that the uh, belief is a shrir loretzoni. It's a, it's a muscle that is not decided by the will, like heart beeps, like digestion. Can you imagine leaving digestion to decide decisions? It's not a good thing. The most, uh, by the way, the most important functions of our body are not dependent upon our decision. Can you imagine someone decides to believe? He will walk in the street and see a car 100 meters from him and he decides to believe that it's two kilometers away from him? It's not a good thing. Right. There is, by the way, a deep chokhmah, chokhmata briya, not to let people decide beliefs. Because who knows what they can construct through decisions. But there is a deeper argument here. It's not only empirical. This is an argument made by, made by Bernard Williams. And by the way, Chizdai Kreskas, if you look at Chizdai Kreskas' comments against the commandment to believe, he makes two comments. One, he says, first of all, it's circular command. It's, it suffers from a logical circularity. Because if you commend someone, he already what? Believes. <coughs> Can you say, God commands you to believe in God? It doesn't make sense. OK, I mean, circular problems always depends on how long the radius is. But still, but he makes another point. Also, here's a conceptual problem. And, I, I'm making this introduction so it will help us in understand the, the posture of faith, understand uh, uh, William James deeper. There is, a, there is a point the following says, it's not just empirical fact that we cannot decide to believe. There is a conceptual structure in the very meaning of believing that doesn't allow us to decide to believe. And what is the conceptual structure? It goes like that. To believe that something, let's say to believe that P, let's call it P a proposition, is to believe that it is true, right? If I believe that God exists, I mean that it's true that God exists. But the very meaning of truth is that there is something out there that doesn't depend on what we decide. It's what we call the hard facts of the world. Unless you are an infantile postmodernist and think that everything is a construction, like, uh, you know, I wish my father is dead. If you'll tell me it's just a mere social construction. Well, I mean, you are really a, a baby if you think this way. It means everything is just merely, you kind of create your world for the verbal place that you have. Truth means, whether you have a sense of truth or not, truth means that there is something out there that doesn't depend on your decisions. The hard facts of life. You want to meet your dead father. He's not there. Yourself, well, if it, death was just merely a, a verbal construction, why can't we construct a world where I can meet him? It's not a merely cons verbal construction that I cannot dunk in basketball. It's a hard fact. Not that an important fact. I mean, OK, for some, it might be very important. So uh, Bernard Williams, who is a very smart philosopher, says there is something deep in the fact that we cannot decide to believe. Why? Because if belief is an attitude towards a proposition that says this is true, and we, if we could have decided that we didn't have the concept of truth, therefore we couldn't believe. There's something deep about that. So 
So let's think about William James. And, and here I want to make a deeper point about belief. William, William James says, yes, yes, the will to believe, decide to believe. How can we do it? But when we look deeper at William James' understanding of the, the attitude of faith, for him, to believe in something is not to claim that that thing is true. It's actually to say something else. It's to say that I adopt this proposition as an hypothesis for an important action that is not reversible. Let, let me give you an example that will clarify that. In my neighborhood in, where I grew up in Beit Vagan here in Yerushalayim, there lives the Baumel family. The Baumel family, Zaharia Baumel, I don't know if you know the name. Zaharia Baumel is a missing soldier from the War of Lebanon, 1982. It's actually my age group. We all knew Zaharia. Missing, missing in action. The father of Zaharia, Mr. Baumel, who actually recently passed away. Basically, all his friends, everybody thought that Zaharia is dead. But the father kept on believing that he is alive. And by the way, the father devoted all his life. There wasn't one stone that he didn't turn to find Zaharia. He got to, to places where nobody got to Damascus. He, he, he operated the whole world, devoted his life to look for, for Zaharia. You ask yourself, what is the attitude of Mr. Baumel? And you can describe him in very two, in very, uh, two different ways, which will mark an important distinction about it, what is faith. One is to say, look, the father says, you all think he's dead because you have this proof and that proof and people saw him, people saw the tank, etc., etc. I, the father, feel his heart beeps in my heart. I know he is alive. I just feel it. I'm certain. That's one to describe. And we have such experiences of the Emuna. Against all odds, I know he is alive. Why? I feel his heart beeps. But there is a completely different way of describing the emuna of the father, which is, you know, you know what the difference between me and the, fa the father and you, the friends? You say there is a 1% probability that he's alive. For me, the 1% is enough to devote all of my life on the proposition that he is alive. By that we mean the following thing. That the munah is not to claim that the thing is certain. By the way, you cannot decide to claim that something is certain. No. A munah is the capacity to act a very meaningful action that is not easily reversible only on a mere hypothesis. I would say again, a munah is the capacity to act a meaningful action that is not irre easily irreversible only on the basis of a mere hypothesis. Let's take our greatest act of emunah, greatest act of emunah that we do, to give birth to a child. You ask yourself, are you certain that the life of this child will be good? Are you certain that he's not going to be born into a world of misery, of deprivation, of war? No. But you make a leap of faith. And you make 
I would say, the most irreversible of all our actions. There are many actions that we can reverse, but bringing, bringing a life, a new life, this is not easily reversible. And you do it just on a hypothesis. Now, what William James said, if our life will be such that all of our actions will be dependent upon certainty, will be castrated, boring, passive, inactive people. There is a glory of emuna, and by emuna we mean not ascribing certainty, but the willingness to act without certainty for something great. You ask yourself, Abraham, Abraham, the father of the knight of faith, Kierkegaard used to call him. What is, the, what is the virtue of Abraham's faith? The Min Ba'ashem. One way to say, he, he, he was certain. When everybody was doubtful, he was certain. Another way to describe Abraham is a completely different way, which is, he was willing to act without certainty. He had a promise, who knows? Someone told him, Lech Lecha. Was he certain? No. But he was willing to walk without certainty. Now, there are very different, if we understand this different attitude, and we have to ask ourselves, when we say that we are Baalei Emunah, what do we... What sort of, what are we when we are Bale Emuna? Let's call him now type A or type B. Are we saying that we are certain about this and this and this? Or are we saying, no, no. The whole virtue of Emuna is that without the certainty, we are willing to commit ourselves to a meaningful action which is not easily reversible. I'm saying, it not easy, I'm saying it explicitly because it's not a big chokhmah to act without certainty or something which is not that meaningful, and it's easily reversible. I don't know, you can say, I'm going for a certain resort to a vacation. Am I sure it will be nice? No, it's a leap of faith. Okay, big deal. You can next time go to another place, etc. The whole point, making aliyah. You know, for many people, so I said, I make aliyah. Do you know it will be good? Are you certain? Are you certain? You know, where are you going? You know what will be the fate of your children in this place? No. It's an act of faith. Now, the two believers will say to each other the following thing. They will locate the leap of faith in a different place. For the one, for Taipei we'd say, you know, what's my leap of faith? I believe it with complete certainty, though I don't have the proofs. You know, by the way, we shouldn't, we shouldn't identify beliefs, believers with fools, because if he believes everything without proof, then he's just a mere, a mere shote. The whole point is that when he goes to a physician or etc., he keeps, he's very careful about proofs and probabilities, etc. But there is an area of life where he is a believer. He has certainty. That's the greatness of his belief. The other one will say, no, the leap of faith is somewhere else. It's not in accepting a certain proposition with full certainty. It's the capacity to commit yourself without certainty. A will say to B, you are not a believer. You just have different hypotheses that you follow. 
B will say to A, what you're doing is not an act of faith, it's just a mere stupidity. Let me give you another example. Chas v'shalom, some, someone is found to be very ill. And they come and tell him, you know, there is this procedure. We don't know whether it works. It might. But it will take, basically, entering that procedure will take everything. And two people can go into this procedure with completely different attitudes, and both are ma'aminim. The first one will say, you know, I know this will work. Don't ask me why. I know it, I feel it. The other one will say, you know, life is so important, at least for me, that I'm willing to commit. And this is a serious commitment. It means a lot of investment, of time, emotion. I'm willing to commit to that only on a very mere probability. I don't know. I find the Jamesian paradigm far more attractive than the others, and in some ways far more heroic. So that's an, another important distinction. Let's call it William James against Bernard Williams. I mean, in terms of the history of philosophy. Or let's call it the two different understanding of Abraham. Or let's call it, tragically, the two different understanding of Mr. Baumel. Or any of us in different important decisions, when we take what we will call a leap of faith, what is it exactly that we're doing? OK, let's move deeper into the issue of faith. So we have believing that, believing in, And uh, then when, when we ask ourselves, what do we mean by believing then or believing it? We, are we talking about ascribing certainty or willingness to commit ourselves without certainty? By the way, what's very interesting about William James philosophically and humanly, not only philosophically, what makes it such a great essay is that uh, it's, uh, it's humanly so deep, is that this idea, look, the world is the world. You cannot change it through decision. Therefore, you cannot decide to believe. It's not exactly true when we come to matters of trust. Because sometimes, Trusting someone actually changes that someone. We know that in work environment, different places, when you trust someone, you empower that someone. You change him. You change both his capacities and his commitments. And William James would say even further, when you're willing to commit yourself to a form of life, through a decision, because you can accept an hypothesis as a decision. Then you'll find out different ways in which that hypothesis will resonate. Take a scientist who devotes his life to a proof of a mere hypothesis. He would never discover whether that hypothesis has echoes in reality unless he commits a life to it. You become, we would say, uh, you become open to that possibility for that act of commitment. OK. I want to talk about, we talked about believing that. We talked about believing in. And I want to talk about believing as. As. 
A-S, as, not as, in Hebrew. In Hebrew I would say, יש להאמין ש, להאמין ב, ויש להאמין כ. I want to explain to you what do I mean by להאמין כ, believing as. Let's take many times you in life different moments someone will come to you and say it's not really about beliefs so other things a judge will come after ruling for death penalty and say to you like that as a human being I'm against it but as a judge I ruled for capital punishment you come to your bank uh, in the bank to someone who works there says should I invest in this uh, stock says you know as a bank official no I don't know as a friend you should right if you uh, if you had let's say a parent let's say your mother is the principal of the school in which you are a student and you had some kind of a problem with teachers and you're being brought to her office and you're the child. She tells you as a principal, you know, you should get this and that punishment. As a mother, we'll talk later. <laughs> you ask yourself, what is the work of this term, as? I had a fantasy of writing a book called As A. So with this title. Or in Hebrew, Ke. He does an immense work. Okay. You know, I knew a great, a great uh, physician doing cutting edge work in cancer in Boston, when I time I spent in Boston. He had this practice every Shabbos to give a Misha Berach to all the people he's treating. And he would say the following, as a scientist, I do everything X, Y, and Z, the cutting edge of science. As a Jew, I do a Mishaberach. Right? We believe as. And you ask yourself, what exactly goes on? I mean, half, three quarters of the people I daven with in, in the synagogue are believers as. Some of them are biblical scholars who do criticism, etc., etc. They don't, they don't leave the Bible, they tear, they tear apart this text. They say, as a scholar, I do X. As a Jew, I, you know, I accept it to be a revelation. You ask yourself, is this just a mere, but this is a deep experience. Now, one way to say, what does it mean, la min ke? One way to say, you know, you don't have, this as means you don't have to bring all your beliefs and roles together to a certain, all the time. You know, when, when uh, a mother who's a principal is now dealing with a disciplinary problem who, with a student who happens to be her son or a daughter, she doesn't have to bring the motherhood into the place. We can, the as allows us to function under different aspects of our functioning without bringing them all the time together. When I'm in synagogue, don't ask me now whether there are three Yeshayahu, or four of them, or five of them. I'm now in the synagogue. Leave me alone. You know? Ke Yehudi, now I'm Ke Mitpalel. It's actually very powerful. But, but there is something that goes deeper with this K. And that has to do with the relationship between faith and identity. And I want to come to explain that. I, I, I said, I want to, the K, the believing is, I want to ask also, I, I want to talk about what is called the crisis of faith in modern Jewish life. 
And I want to give it a different understanding that usually my own teachers, a whole tradition of people who dealt with that crisis understood it. What is, La Amin, what is the relationship between faith and identity? You come to someone, and I don't want to talk only about religious beliefs. Beliefs in general. You come to someone, let's say, you sit at a certain committee, the university, and someone comes with a proposal to check the relationship between racial origin and IQ. And you say, you know, as a humanist, I'm not going to check that. It really is against my identity. It defines me. You know, say, let's say you're committed to be a social democrat. You think that the big government is not a end of the world. You think that government can run a grocery store, especially when government can run a war. Let's say you think so. You happen to think so. And you meet a certain economist. It's very smart with all these numbers to prove to you that actually not helping people will help them more. And you ask yourself, you know, as a socialist, I, I, I don't accept it. What are the proofs exactly, exactly, I don't know. That's my identity. By the way, some beliefs become really part of identity. Do you believe in global mourning, a warning caused by human beings? Is this is just an, a sheer proposition, no more. It's an article of faith. Because if you deny it, that means many other things about whom you are and your identity. It's not like, do you believe that there is human or rational life in Mars or somewhere else outside Earth? No, 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 it's not just a mere question that we have to inquire. It's an identity. If someone comes to you and says, I believe that actually global warming, warming is not caused by human action. You know many things about it. You know that he's not for taxing the rich, you know, whatever. <laughs> that he's not for affirmative action. Why well, you ask yourself, what's exactly global warming have to do with affirmative action? It has. Why it's a, it's a kind of a whole identity that comes with it. You would say the following, and here I want to uh, go a little deeper about the nature of faith. When we say, "Ani ma'amin be'munash lemad ha'kadosh baruch hu natan Torah b'Sinai," what do I say? It's it's not exactly here. I am. This is a proposition. What's my attitude towards that proposition? It really defines my identity. I would say the following. My world, my life will be completely different if I didn't believe in it. It cuts to the core of who I am as a Jew, as a human being, as a person, as a child to that and that family, as a member of that and that tradition, as a member of that and that historical community. That's what I believe in. Now, by the way, sometimes it goes so deeper that you don't care exactly what it means. You know, I did once, a, I had a class once, with my students, I asked them, how many of you believe E equals MC Baribua? How do you say Baribua? <laughs> Square. Everybody says, Betach. So I asked the class, how many of you know what C represents? <laughs> you can say E, everybody knows, energy. M, everybody knows mass. What is C? OK, you know, a speed of light. By the way, not all the class knew that C represents uh, speed of light. By the way, I can attest myself, I believed in that formula before I knew what C represents. <laughs> 
if I don't want to ask here how many, maybe some of you actually don't know what C represents. Or they do, or they don't. You say, you know, my identity as a, as a modern person, trust in, in the scientific community, I take that as a, as a true statement. Do you ask me what it is? I don't know. I believe in Torah Misinai. You ask me, what exactly is Torah Misinai? I don't know. The, uh, by the way, there are so many interpretations. By the way, to believe in Torah Misinai is to believe that the words of Torah are true, whatever their meaning is. It's actually committing yourself to a sort of almost phonetical belief. Yeah. I mean, by the way, some believers will say, not only that I don't know what exactly it means, I actually don't want to get into an inquiry into that. You know, I believe all people born equal. I'm a humanist. Ask me, in what way do you mean equal? Say, so, uh, you know, they're equal. So the, I, I want to ask about the relationship between faith, what is believing as, and faith and identity. And here, let's move further into the, what we'll call the human, the Jewish condition of faith. You have the following account that you get among historians, uh, serious historians of Jewish thought and Jewish religion. And, you are, and they tell you the following, what, in what way we modern are different than our ancestors? And you get the following answer. You read Gutmann, Strauss, Scholem, all of them. We'll tell you, you know what's the difference? They, unlike us, could have taken literally the belief in Torah Min Hashemai. We lost that. Why? There's this foundational belief, the whole system rests on it, Torah mi Sinai. We cannot believe it anymore. We are historically conscious. Uh, we read that uh, actually there are parallels in, in, uh, in ancient Near East literature, that there are few authors, that there are contradictions, We lost our straightforward belief in revelation, and we lost our straightforward belief in tradition. That there is an ongoing tradition from revelation to us. Not only that, we learned that every tradition is an act of censorship. And there were other traditions that were silenced. Also, we learned that tradition, when you look carefully, tradition runs through interpretation. Every act of interpretation is innovation. Not only that, we learned that the very concept of tradition itself is an innovation. We really are, you study seriously, historically, in a positivist, historical way. You go to the university, you lose your faith. Why? If you're a modern man, a woman, you cannot believe in the two foundational beliefs of our great, great parents on revelation and tradition. That's a certain account. And then you ask yourself, is this a serious account of the crisis of faith? And I actually think it's not. And I want to ask, I want to talk about the whole issue of faith and identity, or believing is. You, you, let's say I, I look at my own growing up as a Shomer Mitzvot. I said, how did you come about? What was your education? So, well, first you were told that God exists. Then you were told that God gave the Torah in Sinai. You kind of firmly believe in that. And then you kept Shabbat. 
it's not, the it's not a genuine description. Those beliefs were implied in your identity. You prayed, if you're praying, there must be a God. And by the way, when you lose faith, it's not that one day you wake up and you say, well, maybe actually God didn't give the Torah in Sinai. And you ask yourself, well, fool, where have you been a month ago? Well, just now you got this idea that it could be that he didn't give the Torah in Sinai. What happened to you? And what's happening actually to the guy next to you who's actually still very firm and devout the difference between you is that you assert this foundational belief and he doesn't? It's a strange description. You don't get into faith by accepting a foundational belief and you don't get out of faith by negating a foundational belief. That's not the way it goes. Humanly, religiously. Something else is happening here. Why? Because when your faith is part of your identity, it's whom you are, rather a proposition that you assert. It's not a foundation. It's not like, um, it's really part of the whole meaning of your life and form of life and practice. I would say, if I ask myself, what is the relationship between I'm trying to give it an honest account, okay? I'm, this is not a study of text, but a study of what's going on with the concept of faith. That I'm trying to do a serious effort on that matter. And you ask yourself, really, the whole belief in Torah, Torah min ha-shamayim doesn't validate a form of life. It's the other way around. So the, the, you see a human being, a very spe uh, usually tradition is mediated through a, a, an ideal type. You see, a, you see a Jew, a very special Jew. You say, well, if this came out of that world, there's something worthwhile in that world. If this human being, there's something precious. There's something precious about the form of life that gives power to its foundational beliefs more than the foundational beliefs give power to the form of life. It's like if we look, if we think architecturally, the relationship between faith and form of life and practice, it's not like first you have faith and then it rests. It's like these uh, bridges that are built in such a way that every, um, I don't know even how to describe it properly, but just show it. You know, so you have one pole resting on another pole and you ask yourself, what supports what? Actually, they both mutually support. Now, what happened to the modern Jew? It's not that one day you woke up and say, well, maybe God didn't give Torah Misinai. Why? Because I read all this stuff. And, and, uh, and those fools in the Middle Ages actually never thought about this possibility. But somehow, I, don't know, I read Wellhausen, boom. I read uh, Spinoza's political tractat. Wow. I saw that there are stirot. I mean, everybody who reads the Torah knows that there are stirot. You read the Mechilta, they know that there is stirot. I saw that the Pshat of the Talmud, that the Talmud doesn't really follow the Pshat of the Mishnah. It's an invention. Woof. Now, uh, you ask, uh, the, the, the last weakest of the Rishonim knows that. I mean, even Tosfot Chachmei Anglia. Uh, I don't know, you don't have to be Rabbeinu Tam to realize that. So, uh, and you say, 
but for us, we modern, you know, we have this consciousness that our naive, for, you know, weren't exposed to that, they didn't have. But that's not the story. It's really when the form of life itself doesn't speak to us. that the foundational beliefs lose their power, or I would say they become exposed to inquiry like every other claim. It's where the, the life, the, the life of Shabbat and mitzvot and other things, is, it's really a loss of meaning. It's not a loss of faith in the strict sense. And then it's a, you know, then it's a, you say, you know, I have many, it's interesting, by the way, the, the sort of the generation of my students now. By the way, many of them are, are very devout. I'm talking about students at university. And they study the Zohar, and they're very, you know, serious about that. And they really don't care whether it was Rashbi wrote it, or it was written in 1270 in Castilia by Moshe de Leon, who ascribed it to Rashbi. So what? God cannot reveal himself in Castilia? Is he limited to the Galilee? There's something else is going on. If you show, you want to show them that actually some of the Aramaisms of the Zohar are not really uh, uh, original uh, Aramit Eretz Israelite and there are terms of Spanish in the Zohar, etc. So what? It's really what draws them is the, is the power, the power of the picture, the meaningful of the practice and form of life that comes out of it. When you lose that for a variety of reasons, that's where the crisis is, then those, those beliefs become just other propositions about the world. Probable, possible, usually impossible. Once I had the following, how did I come to thinking about that? I, had the f I was invited to a certain uh, conference in Utah. And uh, it was organized by Brigham Young University. They brought philosophers, etc., Charles Taylor, other things, people that I can learn a lot from. But I was asked to participate in that as well. And none of us actually knew what's exactly our mission. It felt like we are kind of drafted to do something that we are not told about what to do exactly. <laughs> Anyhow, we had a conference. But in the way, I didn't know much about more, I don't know, I know something about the Mormon religion. And I, uh, I, I, a student, a very wonderful student, came to pick me up from the water. I knew that he's Mormon. I wanted to ask him, tell me about Mormonism. What do you believe in? And he began to say, we believe X, Y. It sounded so ridiculous. And I, asked, I said to myself, I hope he doesn't ask me what you believe in. <laughs> it will be as ridiculous, but a little bit earlier. <laughs> now, <laughs> now what, was, what was wrong about this conversation? What's wrong about this conversation? You cannot extrapolate few propositions as the foundation devote from, div divorce from a whole life. They lose their, not only that they lose their force, they even lose their meaning. So, uh, so the issue is like that, right? What, what did I do? I just want to I mean, this is really a, a life inquiry into what do we mean when we mean we believe in. If you come to someone, I'll give you an example, not from the religious step. You become to some, uh, and someone who is an environmentalist. And environmentalism by now is a form of life. It's really a form of life. It's a, even more demanding Shulchan Aruch than what we have, if you take it seriously. Most of you shouldn't be here. Because you flew in. You should have walked. <laughs> or whatever. I mean, if you take it seriously, it's a very demanding form, a, a very powerful. 
meaningful form of life. Now you ask yourself, this whole system rests on the fact that global warming is, is human-made. It's, it's a product of technology. Now, if you ask yourself, what's the relationship between the foundational proposition and the form of life, it's very complicated. Because by now, being such a meaningful form of life with its own force, in terms of behavior and attitude and many other things, it has become an identity. It's not like another proposition to check scientifically. Or I would say, not believing it, it's not a mere error. It's a picorsus. It's heresy. And someone who is a devout environmentalist, he would say, if I lose that, my whole life is transformed. Now, how to, how to convert someone to environmentalism and the other way around? It's not by teaching him the foundational proposition. He really has to adopt the gestalt. Now, for modern Jews, really, the question is, is the life of Torah meaningful? Does it echo? Does it resonate with whom we are and whom we want to be? What, how is it interpreted to us? Many things. This is why I say the following. I read again, I read Strauss, Gutmann, very smart people, usually German Jews. And it's not an accident. And they would tell you that the difference between us and the Rambam, or the Ramban, or Rashi, is that we cannot take at face value the Ikarim, the Ikar. They believed in the Ikar, we don't. And we have very good intellectual, complex intellectual reasons why not. By the way, it's not clear that Maimonides believed in the Ikar, that God gave the Torah, Mina Shamaim, God doesn't speak. What did he do? He whispered to Moshe. He gave him a book. All this Maimonides didn't believe, but whatever. Even Ramban or the Kabbalists don't believe in Torah min as a kind of a moment in a conversation when a sovereign gives command to a citizen. None of them actually, I, I don't want to get into that, the history of that concept. But to say that's the difference, it's, it's really to miss First of all, the nature of faith, and it's to miss the nature of the crisis of faith. So, let me sum up and then we'll have questions. I'm sure there are many of them for good reasons, <laughs> very good reasons. <laughs> so what did I do? I, I made, a, a, a kind of just to begin to unpack the attitude called emuna. So, one way it says, yeah, the most straightforward, she, to believe that, to take a certain proposition, uh, a certain attitude towards a proposition about the world. Then I said, then we, following Buber, said, no, if you look carefully, the relational nature of the attitude called Emuna is la min, lo she, ela, be, believing in. Then we looked very carefully about two very different ways, by the way, opened, opened up by William James and the discussion about James. If we do, if faith is a relationship to a proposition, is it actually giving that proposition certainty against proofs, against usual procedures of proofs? Or no, it's actually committing my, ourselves to that proposition as an hypothesis 
for a meaningful, unreversible action like giving birth to a child in the world, like m migrating to a new country, like building a new synagogue, whatever. Those things that are not easily be changeable. And we do it just not because we know it will be good, but because just the chance that it will be good can mobilize us to act. And without that, we would never know if it would have been good or not. That's Jamesian kind of a almost American claim for faith as an open-endedness of action without certainty. Then we move to, so we said believing that, believing in, and believing as. As a Jew, we believe that. As a humanist, I believe that. As an environmentalist, I believe that. As a socialist, I believe that. Here is really where uh, faith uh, cuts through deep into the very fabric of whom we are. By that we mean if we transform that faith, we, we really will be di we lead different lives. And here I said, well, let's, let's look at it carefully. The relationship between faith and form of life is not faith is a foundation. If you attack that foundation, the whole thing will collapse. You don't go into faith like into uh, Shmirat Mitzvot like that. You don't get out of Shmirat Mitzvot like that. I would say the following. Emunah, if we take Lamin as, and here I will end. Emunah is holding fast or holding dear to a certain proposition about the world that is expressed in a form of life that is precious, in ways in which that form of life gives strength to that proposition far more than that proposition gets to its strength to that form of life. And in the life of a Jew or even another person, usually it's mediated through a role model. Say, wow, you know, everybody has a memory of a, an embodiment and a living embodiment of that tradition it says this is something. And actually, the, the, the most devastating, alienating form is actually uncovering where that embodiment themselves becomes even not only alienating, but even disgusting. It's the worst. We call it, by the way, the harm done to faith by Chilul Hashem. Um, OK, so it's really just the beginning of a lifelong, not only search in what is worthy to believe in, or that, or as, but what is to believe? And uh, you know, just opening the issue, I hope I've at least opened the discussion for you and it made some contribution to the question. So let's have some questions. Yes, please. I don't. is meaningful or irreversible, where does kashrut or turning on and off lights on Shabbat fall yeah. for him? I mean, look, uh, if you take, there's some practices that one by, not one by one are easily reversible or not that meaningful, but the whole way of life. Uh, uh, committing yourself to a tradition. You know, spending your life in Talmud Torah, you ask yourself, uh, that's a, a great, for people who, who like to think or like to learn, they, they spend their life in studying the Shas and they ask, you know, uh, it's, a, it's irreversible because there are many years they have done that. Or, or, or you know, uh, the living form, uh, by that I mean reverse, it's reversible, but there is a cost. 
right? I'm not saying irreversible. Aliyah is also reversible. It's just yored. Misho legam yecholaredet. Or whatever. But there is cost to it. It's not like just changing a car. It's, um, it's, um, by that I mean it's a, it's a manner in which your uh, intensity and depth of, of the leap will be defined by how difficult or what the cost of reversing it will be. And I'm not talking just about economic costs, etc. On the deep level. All, all our, all our, the Jamesian will say, the, William James will say the following. All interesting human decisions are such, if they're meaningful, if they're powerful, are such that they can hang only on a probability, not on certainty. Second, the question whether they were right or not will be actually, cannot be a priori. Proved, it will be proved in the life itself. And third, it's not going to be easy to reverse it. Yes, please. You've given us, like you said, a lot of things to think about. <laughs> It seems to me that you've painted the picture of believing in, in our uh, way of thinking of the world in Judaism. And what, what do we do? How do we act? And how do we live? And you talked about your own personal experience of growing up, Shomer Misvot, and it all makes sense, and it all is a package. And, and what we believe just really doesn't matter. No. And you said that the, that the students that are studying Zohar, they find out things, you know, it's, it's irrelevant because they have this foundation because of who they are and their, their actions in a whole symphony work. And to me that sounds like, well, you're believing, not believing in God, or, but believing in, in Judaism and believing in the way of life. And, and it's irrelevant uh, what the tradition says about God and so on. So the, so the question is, two, two questions really. One is that there's a whole community out there that doesn't have this belief in this way of life. They've lost that way of life. It, it, it doesn't speak to them. It doesn't resonate. And then that person comes into a synagogue where you hear Vizot HaTorah, Sheh Samoshe, and we say Baruch HaTah Adonai, and we say all these things, and they don't believe that. So they say, the whole thing is ridiculous. Sure. So I think that as I listened to you, all I kept thinking of, well, what the real answer is, that we have to redefine what Torah and what God is all about. And for me, that's what Heschel did when he said that Revelation was the Aleph in uh, Anochi, and that everything that we have in Torah is a response to God's presence, and that the Torah that we have is the human response to how we can figure it out. Um, but what my, my question is, because he's asking what's the question, my question is, <laughs> um, we're talking about right. faith. I think there is a lot of questions. In we're talking about faith and belief, and, 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 and I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're leaving this with, with not asking the question about the crisis of faith and belief in a presence that's beyond us, because what you focused on was that it's, it's more a faith in the, the uh, lifestyle. OK. So let me correct an impression. I'm not a religious behaviorist. I, di I didn't say that. I didn't say, well, alvay oti azvu v'torati shamru. You know, God, faith, this is a, no, no. I'm, I, didn't, I don't think that. I don't believe that, or believe in that, or believe as that, etc. I don't. No, no, I, I'm saying. The question is very powerful. 
I don't think that all it matters is just the practice, no matter what the world picture is. The world picture is very important. But the relationship between the practice and the world picture is not you have a foundation of a world picture, and then you have a form of life built upon it. And if you harm the foundation, then the whole form of life collapses. I don't, that's a question that I am doubting. Maybe, I, maybe I'm, I'm wrong in that. So you, have yourself, you ask yourself, not only, I mean, sure that the, 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 the picture of the world, uh, standing before God, believing in God, in revelation, all these categories are immensely important and vital. And you ask yourself, well, if you want to bring into that community people who don't think Vezot HaTorah Asher Sam Moshe. I, I don't think, I don't know, maybe you, you have different experiences. I don't think that what you have to do first is to explain to them in what way Vezot HaTorah makes sense. By that we mean not the Torah, the first letter of the Torah. No, it's they experience a community. And they say, you know, there is something powerful about that community in many forms, in the way they relate to one another, in their time, in their, in their life cycle, in, in etc., etc. It becomes meaningful in, in a deep way which then the question of Torah can begin to make sense. Not that you don't have to talk about it. It, it begins to, even the conversation of what is revelation begins to make sense. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, you know, these are questions that, you know, if we, we, you know we just do things. We don't believe in anything anyhow. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm actually saying that we, we believe that sorry, it's a vital aspect of our life, but its its relationship to a form of life is more complex than just sheer foundations that either you accept them or you deny them. Because the effort, let's take the example of Heschel. By the way, Heschel is quoting, by the way, a very ancient quote. But you ask yourself, what motivates Heschel to begin to reinterpret the concept of revelation? Why don't give it up? Why do you do this gymnastics, the Aleph? No, it says, Anochi Hashem Elohecha. He says Aleph, and we said, Nun Nochi. We say, I'm not, I'm not making it ridiculous, chas v'shalom. I'm just saying the following. I guess Heschel said, there is something precious in all that world that has to be kept living. And it has to do, if you ask me, with a particular, almost I would say, memory, sensibility about this life that then will go on, keep on the discussion of what does it mean revelation in this life, and not that I'm belittling that discussion as such. I mean, and by the way, it's interesting that that discussion began far before anybody read Wellhausen. Just, just a, and it's an interesting historical point. It's not like these Jews were naive, we are historically conscious, and here's, that's our trouble. That's, that's what I'm saying. Um, but, but I think your question has made me clarify that, and I hope it's in some ways adequate. Yes. Thank you for a very stimulating and moving, really deeply moving uh, presentation. Um, one, one thought that I had in response to your idea of, of belief um, and not coming out of identity was that I think that in my experience, and, and I also think in the experience that I see it, um, among my congregants, 
what's what's even more important than seeing a way of life that that speaks to to me or, or to them is personal relationships that is you know this i i feel love from this person my mother my father my grandfather my my teacher my friend and because i experience love from them together with the teaching together with with Torah that then inspires me that that then leads me to believe in um, you know the the, uh, the the deepest things that they embodied and so it's a, a little bit more of a, a love based mm -hmm. kind of um, belief right. that's an aspect of yeah yeah yes please uh, I, I, I'm very curious about your take on James when he talks about that um, not to decide but to leave the the question open. Mm -hmm. And do uh, listening to the, this conversation, I can't tell whether you believe it's possible to leave the question open or not, and whether perhaps. The, the challenge that we've had is that we haven't left the question open at all. We forced people either to believe or we've rejected it. And uh, perhaps, I mean, sort of in my interpretation of the post Matan Torah story, it's pretty obvious that they they relieve themselves of the burden of Matan Torah. But that's sort of the they decided they wanted to leave the question open as opposed to closing the question. And I'm just wondering where you stand on whether you can decide or you have to decide or can you leave. I, I would say the following. That relates to the, the second question that I was asked. Look, the, let's take Torah min Hashemayim. It's a complex, clearly a, an important belief. It has a, a long history, very long history. Uh, now, it was important for a whole generation of Jewish thinkers and scholars uh, to keep that statement alive by infusing it with dynamic new meanings. And uh, it has a long complex history before anybody, as I said, before anybody even read the Hammurabi Code. Because these people were smart, among other things. And, uh, and they developed, you know, Maimonides, um, Kabbalists, the rabbis themselves. Is it a, com for example, a thought? Is, it, is the Torah a command or a gift? Is its authority based on the intention of its speaker? Or now that when it's given to us, it's ours, etc. I mean, it's a long conversation. So what I'm saying is the following: uh, the there is a vital by leaving the question open. I mean, keeping those concepts alive, embodying them with a whole set of meanings. The, that the deep project of Jewish thought, that's the history of Jewish thought, actually. You ask yourself, what is Hashem Echad, God's unity? I mean, we can go on and talk about God's unity, etc. Uh, and, and the fact that we have given these things, not shoving them aside as unimportant because this is faith and we are on the side of practice. Uh, Keeping those issues alive for creative re-rendering and reinterpretation comes from the way in which they are related to a form of life that we cherish. And they are deep part of our identity of whom we are. Uh, and, and, and that connection to that is mediated not through an a priori exception exception of these formulas, right? Or, or rejecting it, it's not by straightforward 
If I look at the generation of Israeli youth, I ask myself, what is damaging to them in terms of their identity as Jews? It's, it's really the behavior of, of the religious establishment much more than anything else. Uh, let's start with that. So let's just uh, what, what type of life this brings about. So for me, the following. I think in that respect, I think James is, uh, I have a different take on the leaving that question open. I don't think that question should be open in the, in the strict sense. It should be a matrix for innovating, rereading of that concept of God, revelation, Torah, etc., etc. Among other things, because it is attached and it will both manifest itself, it's a kind of a feedback relationship with a rich and valuable form of life. Uh, so what I would say is following. If you hook yourself on a dogmatic concept of these issues, right? You, I mean, first of all, it's unintelligent in a serious way, right? It should be, as I said, kept open creatively. That's, that will be my understanding of this. So, so the, the only thing I'm opposed to, in a sense, right, is this, the following thing that the project of Jewish theology is the following. Let's take this life, extrapolate from it those, religious, those dogmatic foundations, and let's examine whether they can withstand criticism or not. And if they don't, the whole thing goes. That's not the history. The history is, uh, is that uh, if we, ex first of all, they're not clearly extrapolated in the strict sense, and second, they kept re being reread, among other things, because they support a valuable and meaningful form of life that gives its content. That's the sort of dialectic, I think, which is more genuine to our relationship. Again, I'm saying, if you think that Shabbat is, let's say you said, you know, Shabbat is a very powerful experience, you know. The gratitude. The gratitude, the sense of gratitude for being given the world. Uh, and you say, we want to keep, that doesn't mean that now the question of creation as such becomes null. I'm not saying that. But it will motivate you to open it in the sense of rereading what it means and what it is about. <coughs> which is the history of Jewish thought. What is Jewish thought? It's the attempt of Jews to give meaning and, and interpretation to that aspects of their world picture. Now, there comes a point in which I would say the modern experience is the following, if I would read them carefully. Those assumptions were kept unprotected. It's just other statements about the world. Because all the protective, valuable form of life was stripped from them for a variety of reasons, deep, by the way, reasons. And then there's just another proposition about the world. I, let's, let's, let's give you the following example. Let's imagine a moment in our time when we will become, we're going to come to talk about global warming without the whole environmentalist movement. Then it will be just another question about the world. OK, maybe yes, maybe not. We don't have enough time to know it. Uh, we have different ways of explaining it. I don't know, Dyson, who is a great physicist, actually thinks it might be not true, etc., etc. That's the experience I'm trying to convey. Uh, by the way, part of the weakness of this presentation, it has many weaknesses, I'm sure, it's that I'm not engaging now in the question, what are they? 
what is revelation? What is God's unity, etc.? It's not that I didn't think about it. I mean, here and there I did. But I'm asking it is, what does it mean to believe in them? What is the attitude called faith? I was trying to enter the exercise of thinking about that. But I'm taking too much time in my answers. Yes. Given what you've described, is there a particular type of art literature <coughs> that you would recommend one should spend time studying that will contribute precisely to, to the, the model you're talking about. To the understanding of what is faith, what is emunah. But that process of reinterpretation, re-engaging. This is just study all of Torah. <laughs> okay, I mean there's... No, seriously. Now you ask myself, are there good, are there, you know, the, the, the history of good, deep Jewish thought, Jewish creativity, right? Great books, you know, Moray Nevuchim, Ramban, Zohar, Rab Nachman, Herman Cohen. All these, all these are powerful thinkers, among other things, Heschel, because they have struggled seriously with these issues. You know, that's, yes. I have, a, I have an issue with the, with the hybrid. You say, when you say, leamin ke, to believe us, uh -huh. isn't it really maybe because I believe in, animamin be, then I mitnaek ke, instead of I, be, I believe ke. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> because I remember, I remember somebody, somebody asked uh, a rabbi that I don't need I don't have to eat kosher to be to feel Jewish. I don't have to go to shul to feel Jewish. And the rabbi said, "Well, you, you remind me somebody has has a boyfriend, and the boyfriend said to this girl, I love you, but never a kiss, never a hug. I don't call you, but I feel that I love you. It's, yeah. well, it's very good for him and zero for anybody else. Right. So maybe I don't need to." Look, feel Jewish to eat kosher because I feel yeah, Jewish. I eat yeah, kosher. I understand. I think that I mean there is a deep question about the role of the interior. I mean, we have because of Protestant influence, there is an assumption that the most meaningful things in our life are what happens in our interior self. But actually, if you ask me, if I want to characterize someone, I'm interested in the things he does unintentionally. You know, this is automatically speaking. It will be more interesting to who he is rather than actually the, the internal events in his inner citadel. There is a beautiful statement about tefillah in the Yerushalmi. They talk about kavanah in tefillah, you know. And someone says, I give thanks. They, they, they discuss their attempt at intending. And one Amora says, I tried to intend and I found myself counting sheep. The other Amora says, I tried to intend, I found myself asking, when we will go before the king, who will be first, I or Rosh Agola? And the other Amora says, I give thanks to my back that it knows by itself to bow when I reach Modim. And now, uh, uh, there is a, there is a, as we come to a different question, a deep question, about uh, where is the weight of who you are as a person? It might be, by the way, that the way, the way rests on those things that you don't need to accompany with inner feelings, that are actually tell whom you are more than, uh, you know, I usually drive to the university without thinking. Sometimes it manifests itself by the fact that I want to get somewhere else and I get there. And it's more telling about me than all my thoughts that I had during the day. But this is a real different 
serious question. So I'm really sorry because uh, we, we have a time limit. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I know that, and really, I know that there are many questions and challenges and things I have to think about in presenting my thoughts, and thank you for allowing me to do that, and that's lachat. <laughs>